Hello and welcome to a special edition of Today's Air Force. I'm Staff Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz. It was 100 years ago on this very spot, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, that then Lieutenant Benjamin Falloy made the first military flight in a plane much like this one. On today's show, we're going to be commemorating that event, as well as taking a look back at 100 years of military aviation. On March 2, 1910, Lieutenant Benjamin Falloy made the first solo military flight. With hardly any support from the Army and practically no experience, Lieutenant Falloy became the first pilot in what would eventually become the world's greatest Air Force. Wilbur Wright managed to give me about 54 minutes instruction. Well, that left me as the only, only man on duty with the Air Force at that time. Eight enlisted men, one busted up airplane, and a half trained pilot myself. Lieutenant Falloy experienced quite a few firsts during his initial test runs. On the 2nd of March, I took it up and made four flights with it. First flight, seven minutes, second, 14 minutes. About that time, I was getting pretty chesty, so I took it up again and got away with 21 minutes. And the last flight, I'd been up about 20 minutes when the fuel pipe broke on me, and I came down and knocked the tail off. In other words, I made four firsts that day. My first solo, my first takeoff, my first landing, and my first crack-up. That's where I started my training down there. The first military aviator took flight 100 years ago. Remembering our roots is key to recognizing just how far we've come since then. Military leaders organized a ceremony to commemorate that first solo flight on the very spot where it happened, at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Senior Airman Chris Piles has the story. Modern military aviation has far exceeded anything the first aviators ever could have imagined when it was first introduced in 1910. The first military pilot, Benjamin Falloy, took to the skies laying the groundwork for what would become the greatest air power in the world. The exploits of pioneers like Falloy have brought the benefits of aviation to every American citizen. I always wanted to learn to fly. My uh, aunt and uncle owned a, an airport on my grandmother's farm and uh, you know aviation has been in our family for quite a while. Don is a seasoned pilot and a volunteer with the Wright B Flyers out of Dayton, Ohio. The Wright B Flyer was the first aircraft sold to the United States military and these volunteers have worked to keep this unique aircraft alive for future generations. Lieutenant Floyd was sent down here to train himself how to fly and he had uh, two good flights that day, a third one in the afternoon and then a fourth one that wasn't so spectacular as far as the landing. Don and his fellow Wright B Flyers came to Fort Sam Houston to pay homage to Floyd and awe the crowd at this year's 100th anniversary celebration of military aviation. As the centennial event unfolded, spectators witnessed a look-alike Wright B Flyer from the sky over the field dubbed the Brown Bird while Don piloted another, called the Yellow Bird, on the ground. The great grandniece of the Wright brothers was in attendance to witness her family's legacy in action. Um, my great uncles, both Uncle Orv and Uncle Will, were true uh, patriots, really loved America, and they spent several years trying to get the military interested in what they had invented because they thought the airplane could be used, in their words, for you know the betterment of civilization. Advancements in aviation technology have come leaps and bounds in the last 100 years. Just imagine what's in store for centuries to come. Senior Airman Chris Piles, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. The Wrights were two boys from Dayton, Ohio, but they did things in a methodical, systematic way. They gathered all the data that could be had. They wrote to everybody who was doing this thing, these things like, like Octave Chanute, for example. Uh, they asked, give us your advice. What do you think we should do? And then they took that advice and they built upon it by gathering their own data. Then they built a, built a small wind tunnel and they took very methodical notes and they were very scientific in their approach as to how to solve these problems. And they realized that there were multiple problems facing them at the same time. And they learned step by step by flying gliders. And so by 1905, 1906, let's say they're, they're flying circles and so on. They've got this amazing machine that will frisk practical heavier than their airplane. Problem is, they don't know how to take that machine and convert it into an income. 
how do they make money from this? Because that's the whole point of it for them. You know, they want to capitalize on, on their accomplishments and hard work. So they need a flying corps, they need some pilots. In 1909, it's easier to make an airplane than a pilot. So they need to have a flying school. The Wrights uh, set the school up and then they went on to have some of those folks fly in their exhibition company that summer and on into 1911. And they would fly at state fairs and air meets and so forth all across the country. So the Wrights, uh, uh, they, they, there's a, it's a kind of a bittersweet story for them. Um, one of the brothers, uh, uh, Wilbur, is on a business trip in 1912. He catches typhus and he passes away in five days. He's gone. Orville lives until 1948. But basically after about 1916 or 17, he's not actively involved in aviation development. He's more of a spokesman. Um, he flies as a pilot for the last time around 1918 and uh, uh, has his last airplane ride in the late, late 1940s. But uh, their, their spirit lives on, of course. And it's, it's that spirit, it's that perseverance and that systematic approach to the problem, I think, that, that showed the way how to solve lots of different kinds of scientific and engineering problems. People like Northrop and, and Donald Douglas, these guys become engineers in the 20s. And they're the ones who then use more high-performance engines. They begin to use metal construction. Uh, they begin to use advanced aerodynamics. So, for example, Jack Northrop's flying wings uh, are very efficient from his, you know, by the standards of 1940, say. Um, so that's the second generation of, of aviation pioneers. And there's, an, there's, you know, there's a romance to aviation. There's something about flying that really captures the imagination and they kind of personify that, that pioneering spirit. Coming up, a trip through time as we take a look at some of the major accomplishments of Flight Test Nation. Welcome back to today's Air Force and our look at 100 years of military aviation. In terms of human history, a century isn't a very long time at all. We have Americans still alive today who were around when the Wright brothers and Lieutenant Falloy were first taking flight. Yet it's difficult to comprehend just how much life has changed since then. In 1910, only one in seven households had a bathtub. Even fewer had a telephone. And even the automobile was still a novelty. There was less than 200 miles of paved road throughout the entire United States. So to say we've come a long way since then is just a bit of an understatement. As aircraft technology has advanced at breakneck speed, one thing has remained constant, the need for brave souls to test out new planes. And for the past six decades, there's been one place for them to do that, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Don Waldman shows us how the airmen of Flight Test Nation have proved over the years that they're made of the right stuff. Located in California's Mojave Desert, Edwards Air Force Base is the heart of Flight Test Nation, sharing its rich aviation heritage with its neighbors, including U.S. Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale and the Mojave Air and Spaceport. Dating back to its origins as a training range in 1933, Edwards, then called Muroc Army Air Base, has been the scene of more major milestones in flight than any other location in the world. It was here, back on October 1, 1942, where the United States entered the jet age when the turbojet-powered Bell XP-59A Aerocomet lifted off from the dry lake bed and took to the skies over Edwards. The success of the jet test programs drew rocket-powered experimental aircraft to the base. The Bell X-1 arrived in late 1946, and on October 14, 1947, Captain Chuck Yeager flew the aircraft to a speed of Mach 1.06 and shattered the myth of the sound barrier forever. Among the aircraft tested during this period was Northrop's giant YB-49 flying wing. It was during a test of this prototype bomber in June 1948 that it broke apart in the sky, killing all five crew members, including Captain Glenn Edwards. Six months later, the base was renamed in his honor. In 1951, the Air Force Flight Test Center was established and the base became well known as the place where the rubber meets the ramp and the de facto center of American flight research, development, test and evaluation. 
The promise of the turbojet revolution and the supersonic breakthrough were realized in the 1950s as the Air Force Flight Test Center tested and developed the first generation of true supersonic fighters, the famed Century Series. On May 25, 1953, North American's YF-100A Super Sabre became the first aircraft in history to fly supersonic on its maiden flight. During this period, Edwards also played a role in the development of systems that would provide the nation with true intercontinental power projection capabilities as it tested aircraft such as the B-52, C-133, and KC-135. It also supported the development of the high-altitude and long-range U-2. With the arrival of the 1960s, the Air Force Flight Test Center partnered with NASA's Flight Research Center at Edwards to explore the hypersonic and near space flight regimes in the rocket-powered North American X-15. In 1961, flying the X-15, Major Bob White became the first man to exceed Mach 4, Mach 5, and Mach 6. Major White also became the first man to fly an airplane into space on July 17, 1962. The major aircraft systems that were tested and developed during the 1960s included the T-38, B-52H, F-4, C-5, and the triple-sonic SR-71 Blackbird. Digital systems and stealth capabilities were developed and tested during the 1970s at Edwards. The Air Force Flight Test Center delivered systems providing impressive combat capabilities to the warfighting commands, including the F-15 Eagle, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, the F-117A Stealth Fighter, and the B-1B Bomber. During the 1970s, new propulsion lift concepts and flight control technologies were demonstrated on the YC-15 and were ultimately applied to the design of the C-17. Edwards re-entered the space arena in the late 70s and early 80s as it teamed with NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center for work on the space shuttle program. On April 14, 1981, the Space Shuttle Columbia landed on Rogers Dry Lake following its first orbital mission. This marked the first time in history that an orbital vehicle had left the Earth under rocket power and returned on the wings of an aircraft. Wrapping up the 1980s, Northrop's B-2 stealth bomber first took to the skies on July 17, 1989, as it flew from Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale to Edwards for developmental test and evaluation. Through the decades, the flight test milestones continued at Edwards. On November 3, 1990, Lockheed's YF-22A Advanced Technology Fighter prototype became the first fighter aircraft in history to achieve sustained supersonic flight without employing its afterburner. The aircraft attained a supercruise speed of Mach 1.58 at 40,000 feet. On February 28, 1998, the Global Hawk unmanned aerial vehicle took to the skies for the first time and conducted a successful autonomous mission. Today, the men and women who work at Edwards Air Force Base continue the mission of flight test and the development of integrated systems. Current programs include the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the Airborne Laser Test Bed, and the X-51A Waverider Scramjet. Don Waldman, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Airmen have achieved countless aviation milestones over the past 100 years. Here now is a look at just a few of those groundbreaking moments in photos. Lieutenant Benjamin Falloy was a United States Army officer who learned to fly the first military planes purchased from the Wright brothers. On March 3rd, 1911, Falloy and Philip O. Parmali made the first official military reconnaissance flight. He became the first military aviator and achieved numerous other military aviation firsts. He led the strategic development of the Air Force in the United States. Charles Elwood Chuck Yeager is a retired Major General in the United States Air Force and noted test pilot. Yeager is best known for being the first man to break the sound barrier on October 14, 1947, flying the experimental Bell X-1 at Mach 1 at an altitude of about 45,000 feet. The Apollo 11 mission landed the first humans on the moon. Launched on July 16, 1969, the third lunar mission of NASA's Apollo program was crewed by Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Edwin Buzz Aldrin. On July 20, 1969, Armstrong and Aldrin became the first humans to walk on the moon. 
The SR-71 is an advanced long-range Mach 3 strategic reconnaissance aircraft. It was unofficially named the Blackbird, and since 1976 it has held the world record for fastest jet manned aircraft, a record previously held by the YF-12. The F-22 Raptor is a single-seat, twin-engine, fifth-generation fighter aircraft that uses stealth technology. It was designed primarily as an air superiority fighter, but has additional capabilities that include ground attack, electronic warfare, and signals intelligence. The Raptor's combination of stealth, speed, agility, precision, and situational awareness combined with air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat capabilities makes it the best overall fighter in the world today. Coming up, a profile of a man whose one small step made him a legend of aerospace. Hello and welcome back to today's Air Force. As an Army helicopter pilot and recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, retired Major General Patrick Brady is an expert in military aviation, as well as a student of its history. The way he sees it, our domination of the skies is one of the biggest contributing factors to America's military power. Uh, aviation took us to a third dimension. Uh, there's no way that the country would be as powerful it is if we did not have the greatest aviation resource in the world. And it's going to go beyond that. I mean, we're going to go all the way up into space and the people who control space eventually will be the most powerful people on the planet. No question about it. It wasn't long after we'd mastered powered flight that America's top minds turned their attention towards space. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy challenged Congress and our fledgling space program to go where no man had gone before, to the moon. Just eight years later, the first man to do that became a true legend of aerospace. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The man who took that small step and giant leap was Neil Armstrong. He spoke those words on 20 July 1969 as he stepped onto the surface of the moon. He was the first human ever to set foot on a celestial body other than our home planet, Earth. Neil had been a naval aviator who'd seen combat action in Korea and a civilian test pilot in the X-15 before he joined NASA's astronaut program. As commander of Apollo 11, Neil, along with lunar lander pilot Buzz Aldrin and command module pilot Mike Collins, blasted off of the moon on 16 July 1969. Imagine a 35-story building being lifted straight off the deck by 160 million horsepower of rocket propulsion, and you'll have an idea of what that launch was like. Despite that, Neil's pulse never went above 109. The linked command, service, and lunar lander modules covered the 380,000 kilometers between Earth and the Moon in three days, three hours, 49 minutes. Average speed, 5,000 kilometers an hour. On 20 July, Neil and Buzz got into the lunar lander, undocked from the command module, leaving Collins to orbit the Moon, descended to the surface of the Moon. The autopilot slowed the craft with retro rockets, but when it looked like the lander was likely to overshoot its target and smash into a jagged crater, Neil took manual control, found a safe area, and brought the lander, named Eagle, to rest. He had less than one minute of fuel left in his fuel tanks. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Armstrong and Aldrin skipped a planned rest period, depressurized Eagle, opened the hatch, and Neil descended the ladder to make history. There are only five photographs partially showing Neil or his reflection on the surface of the moon. Now that's because he, not Buzz, carried the still camera. Neil's reflection in Buzz's visor is the best still photo of Neil on the moon. The crew spent 21 and a half hours on the moon, two and a half of those hours walking and working on the surface. 
Eagle blasted off from the moon at 17 hours 54 minutes on 21 July and docked with Columbia. They jettisoned the lander and flew back to Earth. The command capsule splashed down in the Pacific just before dawn on 24 July 1969. It's estimated that 450 million people around our globe heard Neil say one small step live on radio or television. At that time, that was well over 10 percent of the world's population. A group of airmen in Europe recently had a chance to visit with a special group of men, living links to our air power heritage. Tech Sergeant Lee Bellinger brings us the story of the Legends of Aerospace tour. An all-star lineup of legendary astronauts and aviators visited the Kisling NCO Academy for the first stop on the Legends of Aerospace tour. The legends include Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Gene Cernan, the last to walk on the moon. When we return this rock, or some of the others like it to Houston. Jim Lovell, the Apollo 13 commander. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Bob Gilliland, the first to fly the SR-71 Blackbird. and Steve Ritchie, the last Air Force fighter ace. Getting this historic group to say yes to a tour for the troops was easy. I said yes because uh, I'm sitting back home and there's a lot of legends out here, you know, stationed all over the world that uh, I'd like to see and thank for all the work they're still doing. It's a payback on my part. You know, I've been so lucky I've been in service most all my life, naval aviator, uh, and a lot of things went my way. It's my turn to give something back. So for this first stop, it's a panel discussion moderated by David Hartman. The legends have a chance to talk about their careers and offer up some advice for these Air Force NCOs. The people that we have here, uh, we all have lived on the edge uh, in our, in our you know, active careers. The soldiers, the Marines, the Air Force people over here are all living on the edge trying to do a good job. And so, uh, you know, there's a little rapport that we like to go. We'll find out what they're doing and we can maybe say some things about, you know, in the old days and when we were 30,000 feet flat on our back, you know, <laughs> we could do that kind of stuff. These five men had the right stuff, but still they're not entirely comfortable with being called legends. I, oh yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed when they call us le le legends of aerospace. I think the real legends are the people that are, are out there in the trenches right now and uh, doing the work. Tech Sergeant Lee Bellinger, Cape and Air Station, Germany. Well, that does it for our special edition of today's Air Force. We hope you've enjoyed our look back at 100 years of military aviation. I'm Staff Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz, and for all of us here at today's Air Force, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Ready to take us up, Don? Okay, I got full throttle. Here we go.